أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ليجزي الذين أساءوا بما عملوا ليجزي الذين أساءوا بما عملوا ويجزي الذين أحسنوا بالحسنى الذين يجتنبون كبائر الإثم والفواحش إلا اللمم إن ربك واسع المغفرة هو أعلم بكم إذ أنشأكم من الأرض وإذ أنتم أجنة في بطون أمهاتكم فلا تزكوا أنفسكم فلا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن اتقى فلا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن اتقى أفرأيت الذي تولى أفرأيت الذي تولى وأعطى قليلا وأكدى عنده علم الغيب فهو يرى أم لم ينب بما في صحف موسى وإبراهيم الذي وفى ألا تزر وازرة وزر أخرى وأن ليس للإنسان إلا ما سعى وأن ليس للإنسان إلا ما سعى وأن سعيه سوف يرى ثم يجزاه الجزاء الأوفى وأن إلى ربك المنتهى وأنه هو أضحك وأبكى وأنه هو أضحك وأبكى وأنه هو أمات وأحيا وأنه هو أضحك 
حكى وأبكى وأنه هو أمات وأحيا وأنه خلق الزوجين الذكر والأنثى من نطفة إذا تمنى وأن عليه النشأة الأخرى وأنه هو أغنى وأقنى وأنه هو رب الشعر وأنه أهلك عادا الأولى وثمود فما أبقى وقوم نوح من قبل وقوم نوح من قبل إنهم كانوا هم أظلم وأطغى والمؤتفكة أهوى فغشاها ما غشا فغشاها ما غشا فبأي آلاء ربك تتمارى هذا نذير من النذر الأولى أزفة الآزفة ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة أزفة الآزفة ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة أفمن هذا الحديث تعجبون وتضحكون أفمن هذا الحديث تعجبون تعجبون وتضحكون ولا تبكون وأنتم سامدون وأنتم سامدون فاسجدوا لله واعبدوا فاسجدوا لله واعبدوا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح اسم رب بك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قد قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء 
أن أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى صدق الله العظيم Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for that beautiful recitation. And thank you all for coming to our Muharram lecture series on the 23 years of prophethood and transformation. This year's lecture series is sponsored on behalf of the Marhumin displayed on the TV screen located just outside the, the chapel. And can you please recite a Surah Fatiha for these and all other Marhumin Al Fatiha? Just a quick uh, health and safety notice. Uh, in case of an emergency, the fire exits are located outside of the back of the chapel, uh, the main entrance outside the chapel, and the double doors by the dining room. Can I request uh, that you do not park in the roundabout? If you have, uh, can I politely ask for you to move your car um, if it's by the roundabout? We also have a conference room that is available, um, So, and we highly encourage families with children to use the conference room. Without further ado, I would like to invite Sheikh Arif to deliver tonight's lecture. Please, can I requ request you all to recite a salawat and move forward? Others, salawat Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام So the Prophet is in Medina and later on as the Quran declares he has sent his messenger with a deen in order for it to prevail over all deen Now the immediate meaning of this that we can understand is by the end of the verse وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ or walau kariha al-kafirun the prevalence of the deen of the blessed prophet over all deen does not mean the conversion of the entire region to islam now this is important for us to bear in mind it is singling out the kafirun and the mushrikun the prevalence of the deen meant that islam as a religion would prevail over the region there would be no more space for kufr and for shirk and their value systems because it was their value system that ruled over the region. It does not mean conversion to Islam of all the other faiths that were not upholding the values of shirk and kufr. And we can see that evidently from Surah Baqarah all the way to Surah Ma'idah, sequentially as these verses were being revealed, that the Prophet was accommodating the Jewish, Christian, Sabian community. Later on, the Zoroastrians were accommodated and then we find that the attitude that he created within the minds of the Muslims was later on that when the Arabs came into trade contact with the Hindus, they accommodated the Hindus as well. And then at Muslim conquests, when the Muslims spread far and wide, they were beginning to give a sort of status of Abrahamic faith to the Buddhists and to people of other faiths that did not strictly belong within the Abrahamic faith, but in one way or another, they were trying to give them and accommodate them. So the verse of the Quran was to finish off the status quo, to replace it with Islam and Islam embraces all religion, all religion that subscribe to the same values and, that, and who are monotheistic. And that is why in Surah Tawbah, towards the end, and then this is a prelude for today's talk, in Surah Tawbah, you find the Muslims being exhorted to fight with other empires or other countries that are belonging to the people of the book. Yet, the Quran makes it very clear that they do not believe in God or the hereafter or abide by the righteous religion as opposed to the earlier Christians of Medina and the regions around Medina and the Jews, the Jewish people. So the deen of Islam does not mean conversion to Islam. It means the broad tenets of Islam at a state level would be operating. The sense of justice, the sense of worshipping one God, the sense of doing righteous deeds. And if a group did not belong to that, then that group did not have any space within the new state and the new religion. Otherwise, all the other religions were subsumed and by, were accommodated. I discussed this in book four, that it was a very broad system that the Prophet created based on monotheism and righteousness within the soul and justice as a societal principle to accord rights to others. Now, the Prophet only has 10 years in Medina. Whether the Prophet knows this or not, 
But the plan of God, as we see now in hindsight, was to unfold in 10 years. Now for him to establish the religion of Islam and to create a state and a broader state within 10 years is next to an impossible task. You go around preaching, it takes forever, doesn't it? I remember I was at Hajj, and I can't remember the year now, 2012 or something, and I was wearing sandals as opposed to the flip-flops in Mina. So the Molanas and the uh, devout Kojas, they descended upon me. And they said, how dare you wear sandals? I said, it's my feet and they're hurting me. And they said, well, you're not allowed to. I said, according to my own ijtihad, I used to do it at that time as well. It's perfectly allowed. So they were enraged. After seven years, they changed the fatwa and they were allowed to wear sandals. Now, if it takes seven years to go from flip-flop to sandals, now imagine how long it takes for people to organically evolve into a new message and shift the whole paradigm. It would have taken the Prophet two or three hundred years to convert the whole region. So what do you do? What you do is you pick a fight with the boss. That is something quite intriguing. I was in the... Now this is going back before most of you people took birth and before recorded history began. When I was 16. I'm glad you're listening. So I was in a sixth form college, and there was a there was a man there. Was a, he was the boss, the real don. He was a patan, and his name was Jahangir. And we, I was in the common room, and they were all, you know, smoking away their joints and everything. It was quite a pleasant sort of an atmosphere because you always felt happy around them. In any case, he is the don. Now he sits there with all his gangs and the followers and they had the might. I used to pray namaz at that time. I used to say, I want my prayer mat and I will pray and whatever. So they respected me to an extent. But at the same time as well, there was fear in my heart as to what these guys could do to me. So now once Jangir called me, he said, Arif, I said, what? He said, come here. So I was thinking, right, if I don't go there, I'm going to get it. And if I do go there, then it means I'm surrendered to him. Now, what happened was that I tripped and he was sitting there and I was fall as I was falling on him. I thought I'm dead anyway. Let me take a punch at him. So I punched him and then punched him again. And he was caught by surprise. Then his followers, they well, the, the kids there, they separated me. By the time he got up, he was full of admiration. He shook my hand. He said, you're the only person here who has the guts to do this. Now, I know he could have flattened me and he could have killed me, but it, it won me the appreciation of all of them at that point. What do you do? You become strategical. The prophet cannot spread his message within a span of 10 years. It's an impossible task. Now, look at the context of the blessed prophet and his genius. And at the same time, he was so sincere being led by the day. He has matured and deepened in his own self. He is no longer now merely receiving revelation from Jibrail or from God that he calls Quran. He is being inspired. He has dreams. He has intuition. All of these things are within him. He is now sure of his own self. It's no longer the case that was in Makkah, Yasin, Wal Quran, Al Hakim. Inna ka la min al mursaleen. Don't doubt. Although the Quran doesn't say don't doubt, but the stress. Inna ka. Indeed, you are amongst the messengers or amongst the prophets. That is no longer the case. He knows he is the messenger. Even when uh, uh, Khalifa Umar objects to the uh, treaties of Hudaybiyah, he says to Umar, Indeed, I am a prophet and I know what I'm doing. And then, of course, the justification comes in Surah Fat subsequent to that. But he had taken the decision without the formal revelation. So the prophet's being has deepened. He can take decisions. He uses his own discretion. Now here is Medina. On the one hand, he is a guest of the people of Medina. On the other hand, he is their head. He has a community with him. They do not have any means of financial support. The first thing the prophet did was he made brotherhood. 
between the people of Makkah and Medina. So the people of Makkah were living off the people of Medina. And you do know that that cannot continue. That is something that will not continue. Now later on, you find an evidence for this. When the Prophet went to battle with Bani Mustaliq, Abdullah bin Ubay, who was a character known for his defiance and rejection of the Prophet, and I'll talk about it in him about in a little while, he said to his group of people who were influential and quite large, and this is recorded in Surah uh, Munafiqun, لا تنفقوا على من عند رسول الله حتى ينفضوا. Do not spend your wealth upon the people who are with the messenger of God until they go back and go away. Because their thing was that, look, we are keeping these people. If we stop giving them wealth and money, they will be forced out of Medina. So you know when you go as a guest to a city, you cannot remain a guest. You have to earn for your own self. In fact, you have to contribute to the city. So that was a problem. On the other hand, you had the massive Jewish clans and tribes, especially three of them that were very, very big. The Banu Qaynaka, Banu Nadir or Nudair, and Banu Qurayda. These people were also very suspicious of the Prophet, but they had a treaty with the Prophet that they will not be treacherous. They would not default on their treaty by siding with the enemy or by attacking the Muslims. So there was a threat, one, from the Jewish people. Two, the Medinian Muslims that had embraced Islam, which was majority of them, did not really understand the Islam of the Prophet and they were very suspicious of what is going on. Yes, they were led into Islam like most of us are, but then afterwards we think, I don't really understand this new religion. So they were suspicious, they weren't understanding. And then there was a huge group of Muslims like Abdullah bin Ubay, who was destined to be the head of Khazraj and possibly the head of Aus and Khazraj who were fighting amongst themselves. And when the Prophet came into Medina, they all embraced Islam. So obviously he was disgruntled, he did not like the Prophet, he accepted Islam because it was convenient for him. He also had a hundred people with him that were following him. Now, these were called the Munafiqeen afterwards by the Quran. Now, you can imagine how strong this group was that when the Prophet went for his second battle in Ohad, he had a thousand people. The Meccans were three thousand. I'll take you through the chronology in just a little while. The Meccans were three thousand. The Prophet had thousand. This man with his hundred, with, with 300 followers, they left the battlefield. That's a sizable community. Now you, you will definitely ponder that if there are 300 men that are leaving the Prophet, then they also have families and children. So you can imagine the amount of numbers of the people of Medina who were not only skeptical of, of the Prophet, but who were opposed to the Prophet internally. And their whole understanding was that this prophet is bringing trouble upon us. We did not ask for all these battles and for all this war and all this chaos. And we were living on friendly terms with the Quraysh. Why do we need this? And it's a real life story. This is how things happen. When somebody comes to you and gathers a band of people and then invites wars in your own house and fights, that's not something very comfortable. So it's a very real story that is taking place. So on the one hand, you have the Jewish clan. On the other hand, you have the Munafiqeen. Then you have the Medinian people who are not really understanding what's really going on. Then you have the big shot, the Quraysh. And in the midst of all of that, you want to spread your religion. Now that is the context. If you read the Quran chronologically, and of course the battles of the prophets and the raids are something that we really do need to understand in order to get a proper appreciation of the metal of this man, how he grew into the revelation, how he began to take uh, decisions, the strategy that, it, that he had, and at times when things would go wrong, how they would be tweaked to put right again, and the trajectory was set on course once again for his success. So now, did the Prophet know that he would spread the religion within 10 years? He did not have any assurance, any, he, had, 
given, he had been given zero assurance. As we've been citing the verses of the Quran, I don't know what will be done to me or to you. O Muhammad, we may show you some of what we have promised to do to them, or we may just kill you before that. Now the Prophet did not know whether this verse meant at the end of his missionary journey, or it was an immediate meaning. So he was left on knife's edge, and we will see this throughout. Because it was such a true, real, human story, that is why it's yielded so much success. But the way things are unfolding, and the way things are falling in place is amazing. So now, the only way for the Prophet now to secure himself economically, is to raid the Qureshi caravans. Now you ask, why would a Prophet want to raid caravans, trade caravans? The justification here that the historians present, and of course, uh, Karen Armstrong also presents this justification, that it was the norm back in the day that you raid caravans and it economically enriches you. <clears throat> and that's why caravans would take different rules and need protections. But I don't think that that was the case, as you will see in a little while. In the case of the Prophet and the caravan, it was a case of justification. There was a justification there, which we will read in a little while that the Prophet felt that he was expelled from his home. And that the Muhajirun who left Makkah and came to Medina, their properties were confiscated. Now the Meccans are seeing this very differently. They are saying, well, you dishonored us by defecting and going to the other side. So they were enraged. They just did not like the Muslims. On the other hand, the Muslims are saying, you expelled us. Can you see that? Now, this is an argument. You need a diplomat here to bring solution to both sides. Thank God there weren't any diplomats there because it wouldn't have happened otherwise. In fact, when the Prophet might have wanted a diplomatic solution, the Quran was against it. You may have been inclined to them somewhat. And the Quran's tone is stern. There is no way you are going to compromise with them in any form or shape or manner. This religion has to go, finish. The Quran had decided this religion has to go. So there was a justification here that they have expelled us from our houses. So we are in a state of combat with them. Now, if you remember the treaty of the Prophet, there you have the common enemy known as the Quraysh, against who everybody will be united and nobody will be their allies. So then the Prophet orders raids on the Qurayshi caravans but six of them or seven of them they fail the eighth raid takes place the muslims kill a person capture two people and get their properties the raisins and dates and whatever they were trading in and they bring it back to medina what happened was that this raid and killing happened in the month of rajab the month of Rajab is a sacred month. There is no killing in the sacred month. That was the Arab custom and the Jewish custom as well, that you cannot kill anybody in those sacred months. There is no warfare, flatly, finished. So the people who went for the raid, they were all the Muhajirin. None of the Ansar had joined them. Not because they did not want to, but the people selected only the Meccans to go for these raids. Now, when they came back with the spoils of war, the Medinan Muslims were rebuking the Muhajirin for killing a person in the sacred month and waging a fight and capturing two people. We, when we read history, of course, and we have to read it broadly, the Prophet was perturbed. Well, what do I do now? What do I do now? Now, although... Some gave the justification that the Prophet said, well, I asked them to raid, but not to kill in the month, the sacred month. So it might have been the first of Rajab, and therefore it was just in the sacred month. And they should not have done this. So you can see that the Prophet may not have intended them to raid the caravan in the sacred month. They nonetheless did it in the sacred month, and they killed someone. Now here is a problem, a real existential problem, because the Muslims 
They feel you should not have done this. We should honor the sacred months. The Jews saw this as a bad omen. And the Quraysh said, Muhammad's religion violates even the sacred month. Now, this was a very difficult time for the Prophet. This is where we see the intervention of the Quran. And there is exceedingly more and more direct form of intervention from this point onwards till the end of the prophetic mission. So this verse comes. Yasalunaka ani shahri al haram is in Surah Baqarah. They ask you about the sacred month, qitalun fi, in terms of warfare within the sacred month. Now look at the language of the Quran. Kul qitalun fihi kabir. Say that warfare is a grave sin in the sacred month. وَالسَّدُّنْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ But yet, blocking people from the path of God and disbelieving in God and blocking people from the Masjid Al-Haram and to expel the people of Masjid Al-Haram from Masjid Al-Haram is far greater than warfare in the sacred month. Can you see this? This was the justification that was given. Well, fitna to akbaru min al qatl. Discord is far worse than shedding blood in the masjid uh, in the uh, in the month of the sacred month. Wala yazaluna yuqataluna kum hatta yarudduna kum an dini kum in istatau, and they will not cease to fight you until they cause you to turn away from your religion as long as as, as much as they are able to. So here the Muslims are given justification. Once that justification comes, the Prophet is acquitted of any blame. And those people who have, who mounted the raid, they were acquitted of any blame because now God has sanctioned it. Now obviously, you are seeing the minds of the Jews here saying that, no, this is very convenient, this verse. The Munafiqeen are saying, this was a real chance for us. But it is slipped out of our hands. The naive Muslims are saying, you know what? Look at them. They are a strong group of people. They can raid caravans with impunity in this instance. They can bring back wealth and they can economically bring us stability. So now in the mind of the Meccan Muslims, they are getting assured, but not fully. The Munafiqeen are getting more and more frustrated. The Jews are getting extremely frustrated. Now what we see is that the Medinan people are more than happy to participate in raids. So then the Prophet gets news that Abu Sufyan is advancing from Syria through a route that crosses them with huge amounts of wealth of the Quraysh. Now the historians will say to us, I mean the apologetic ones, that the Prophet must have thought that had he raided that caravan, it would starve the Quraysh into submission and surrender. I'm not very sure if that was the case. I'm not sure if that was the case. Maybe the Prophet just thought it's a convenient thing. We can get their caravan. It can secure us economically. So in this instance, the Muhajireen were about 80 and about, uh, I'm not a good coach as far as calculation is concerned. So there were 313 to 315 people, out of which 80, 88 or 83 were Muhajireen. The rest of them were Ansar. Two-thirds were Ansar, one-third were Muhajireen. Over two, uh, yeah, two-thirds, over two-thirds were Ansar, one-third were Muhajireen. They went in pursuit of that caravan. I don't want to under, uh, deal with the battle here. I want to deal with something else. They were in pursuit of the caravan. Now here you can see that how things are being planned beyond the Prophet's strategy, strategy of the Prophet. They're going towards the caravan. Abu Sufyan gets news. So he hurries to Makkah to get a force. Abu Jahal and they gather a force of a thousand people to advance towards the Muslims in order to finish them off. Abu Sufyan cleverly steers the caravan through a different direction and the danger is averted like the previous raids. All of them had failed. So Abu Sufyan sends back the message to the Meccans, we don't need to engage with these people. Abu Jahl said no. He was very articulate as well, Abu Jahl, and one of the 
known people of Mecca. He said, no, we will kill them and we will celebrate. Now, if you look at it differently, you will say that the Muslims did not know what they were going for. They really did not know that they will end up in a full-fledged battle. The Muslims only thought 300 of them are going to go and raid a caravan and bring the goods back. They were pursuing the caravan. The Meccans thought, well, they are 313. Why not just engage with them and finish them off? This is what I call intervention of the divine. Something else was happening here. They did not know that the plan was being made at a different level. There were interdimensional connections and play. Now, in our lives, we are very mindless of the things that are happening above us that bring incidences together. It's only in hindsight when we look and we say, actually, you know what, that was the best thing that ever happened. And I really don't know. It was a sheer coincidence that that happened. But it was the best outcome. It shaped the rest of my life. Right? This is something, do you want me to give you an, ex an example? No? Okay. So things were coming together. Now, the Muslims advanced towards in the direction of Badr. And the Meccans were coming to Badr. Now the Prophet was primed as to what is going to happen. The Muslims were largely on foot. They did not have weaponry. The Meccans had hundreds of horses, camels, and fully mailed, or a lot of them, and they had their archers and swords and spears and whatever else they had. I want to recite certain verses here. These, the incident of Badr comes in Surah Anfal, and again in Surah Ali Imran, in two places. The justification for this particular battle is, this is because they acted adversely to Allah and His Messenger. And whoever acts adversely to Allah and His Messenger, then surely Allah is severe in requiting evil. But these verses are revealed subsequent to the decision that the Prophet, the Prophet took on that day. Now, it seems that the Prophet already had a premonition and God talks of this premonition. And when Allah promised you one of the two parties that it shall be yours, and you loved that the one not armed should be yours, and Allah desired to manifest the truth of what was true by his word and to cut off the roots of the unbelievers. So the prophet was under the impression that he will either get the caravan or he will meet them at Badr. And the prophet desired that he gets the unarmed one, the one at the caravan, Abu Sufyan's caravan. Yet the verse is saying to the Prophet, but God wanted to decisively prove a point and to cut off the disbelievers through this battle. But now you see that the Muslims are outnumbered, 313 or 15, and the others are about 1,800 to 1,000. What happened subsequently to that? When Allah showed them to you in your dream as few. So the Prophet was receiving communication in his dreams. And he was trusting those dreams. But those dreams were not termed as Quran. And if he had shown them to you as many as you, then you would have certainly become weak hearted. And you would have disputed about the matter. But Allah saved you. Surely he is the knower of what is in the chests. So the Prophet himself is being told that Allah showed them to you few in numbers. When you looked on in the battle of Badr, they appeared few to you. Now imagine if you're only 313 people and you see thousand people fully armed on horses and camels, that in itself would cause a lot of terror and fear. There are several things that are happening here. And then on the other hand, what is happening is, and when the shaitan made their works fair seeming to them and said, no one can overcome you this day and surely I'm your protector. On the other hand, the shaitan was inspiring their heart that you will have decisive victory on this day. So Abu Jahl was being motivated 
by this anger and rage that we will finish them off and we will kill them. On the other hand, the Muslims were shown those people as a small group. Allah says, and he made you appear to them as very small as well. But look at the other thing that the verse says, and I'm, I'm, I'm selective here. And when you sought aid from your Lord, so he answered you, I will assist you with a thousand of angels following one another. And when your Lord revealed to the angels, I am with you, therefore make firm those who believe. I will cast into their hearts, into the hearts of those who disbelieve. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. It's amazing the sort of things that are happening at Badr and the sort of intervention that is taking place. So the Meccans are somehow being inspired that kill these Muslims. They are offensive bunch of people. They are very few. On the other hand, the Muslims are being told that you're being assisted by God and by angels. Now on that note, I just want to ask a question here and then we will think about it for the next few years and then we will come to it if Allah gives life. When Allah said, وَلَقَدْ رَعَاهُ فِي الْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ The Prophet saw him in the, in, in the horizon and the sky. One Jibreel filled the whole of the skies and horizon. God is sending thousand angels. Can you see that? Thousand angels. The Muslims are 300 something, the Kuffar are 800 to 1000. Are the angels so weak that you need 1000 angels? Think about this. And then Surah Ali Imran says, and then I will assist you with 300 more, uh, 3000 more angels. So you see, here it is, when we read the Quran, we begin to understand that we have not understood things accurately. There is something else going on. There's an interplay of different dimensions. Angels is not a simple word. There are many different things happening. <clears throat> in any case, now, in Badr, when three opponents are called, Imam Ali, Hazrat Hamza, and a cousin of the Prophet come and defeat their opponents, and two of them are related to Hind, or three, all three of them are related to Hind. Then at that point, the Prophet said to the Muslims, whoever amongst you falls into their ranks without a meal will go straight into paradise. The Muslims threw whatever they were eating and they went and they charged at the Meccans. It was a decisive victory for the Muslims because the Meccans were seeing them few in numbers, yet they were finding they're coming from everywhere. And they had this strength. So the angels, the strength of the angel was not this sort of mystical being is coming and chopping heads off. The strength of the angels was working through the physical bodies of the Muslims. You know, all these stories that Abu Sufyan said, we saw riders on horses coming from the sky. If anybody were to see that, they would run away straight away, wouldn't they? They didn't see any riders coming from the sky. They would have run away. They didn't see any such thing. These are the stories we make up. The evidence for that is that the Quran says that if there are 20 of you, you will over 200 of you, you will overcome 2,000 of them. Now Allah knows there are weak amongst you. So a thousand of you will overcome two thousand. That, that's the ratio. I can't remember the numbers exactly. It just shows that the strength of faith was assisting. Allah was assisting them through their strength of faith. Now when the Muslims died and they killed a great many of the people of Makkah. I just want to read a few more things that, 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 that is happening here. Uh, and my time is finishing very, very rapidly. I want us to get an understanding of what is happening. There are a few things here to note. <clears throat> the people around the area, they are saying this is a force to be reckoned with. They took on a thousand people. They did not care less for their life. Look at their strength, look at their resolve. They are rich, they are prosperous, they are united. They are disciplined. They are the emerging power. Imagine how it would impact the onlooker. They are all little tribes at war with each other. And of course, they subsequently united against the Blessed Prophet. But the impression that it created in their minds. Then, the verses came down. It is amazing. These are in Ali Imran in response to the people who run away in Battle of Ohad. 
La tahsaban alladhina qutilu fi sabilillah amwatan. Do not reckon those slain in the way of Allah as dead. Bal ahya inda rabbihim yurzaqoon. They are alive, they are being sustained by their Lord. Farahin bima atahum Allah min fadli. They are delighted with what Allah has given them from His grace. وَيَسْتَفْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And they are giving good tidings to those who have not yet joined them. أَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There is no fear upon them and they will not grieve. يَسْتَفْشِرُونَ بِنِعْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ They are giving glad tidings of the blessings of Allah. وَفَضْلٍ وَأَنَّ اللَّهِ لَا يُضِيعُ عَجْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And they are giving the tidings of great uh, grace from God and Allah will not go, uh, bring to waste the actions of the believers. Now, you read verses like this to somebody, to young people, what will it do to them? It will spur them even more. That freshness of faith. This is what we need. We are on the right path. And people, youth, like fighting. They've got that much aggression in them. And these are Arabs, meat-eating people. I mean, we all eat meat, but these guys are real meat. I forget all of that. 50 to 70 Meccans are killed. 70 are captured, 14 Muslims are killed. Now look at the strategy of the Blessed Prophet. He says, what do we do with these captives? Of course, the people of Makkah, they ran away. They left all their goods behind. So the Muslims bought them and the people of Medina were overjoyed. That Look at them. They're getting the spoils of war. We need to join them next time round. Indeed, there is a God. Indeed, he is the messenger. Indeed, his discretions are... Accurate. So they were all getting empowered. Munafikin were getting frustrated. The Jews were getting even more frustrated. In any case, he said, what do we do with these captives? So he was given the advice. Let them pay ransom and free themselves. So the ransoms were levied in accordance with their statuses. They paid their ransoms and they left. However, other things were also happening. Walid bin Walid, the brother of Khalid bin Walid, his ransom was paid by Khalid bin Walid. But for the time in which he stayed with the Prophet, the conduct of the Prophet and his community impacted him to such an extent that he went back to Mecca, then came back as a Muslim. They asked him, why didn't you just stay in Medina? He said, least anybody thinks that my conversion was a convenient conversion. I wanted to prove that it's a genuine conversion. Then the Prophet's son-in-law was captured. He had an adopted daughter by the name of Zainab. Now he didn't, he didn't have any money to free himself from the Prophet, of course, being very sympathetic, adopted daughter of Khadija. So he sent word to somebody in Makkah to send his ransom. Zainab sent her necklace. The Prophet wept. The Prophet said to the Muslims, do you allow me that she is the daughter, adopted daughter of Khadija, to honor the mother of the Believers, of course, they were not given the title of mother of the believers, but to honor the Bibi Khadija and to send this necklace back and send him back. On the proviso that he lets Zainab come to Medina, migrate to Medina because Zainab had converted. He allowed Zainab to come to Medina. Now this man did not convert. At the conquest of um, uh, Makkah, the man converted. The Prophet said to Zainab, go back as his wife. I'm just saying, look at the broadness of the Prophet. He did not say at that time that you cannot be married to a mushrik and your marriage gets null and void and it's broken. No, the Prophet's strategy was extremely different. There were other people from the captives who could not free themselves through ransom. The Prophet said to them, whoever were literate to teach the people of Medina to read and write, and that would be something that gives them their freedom. Now, the problems continued with the Munafikin and the Jewish clans. One by one, the Jewish clans were expelled because of their breaking, breaking their treaties with the Prophet by joining the Quraysh. So, Qaynaqa were expelled. The Bani Nadir were expelled because of what they were planning to do uh, to the Prophet by assassinating him. But when the Meccans laid siege on the Madanin, Madinian community, Bani Quraidha, were helping them. It is here in Surah Ohad that you need to read the verses that explain the situation. In Ohad, the Muslims fled 
hearing that Muhammad has been killed. But the verse of the Quran is, Ma Muhammad illa Rasul. Muhammad is not but a messenger. Kad khalat min qablihi rusul. Before him have gone many messengers. If he is killed or if he dies, shall you turn back? So here the Quran was telling them that the message that is coming here is not contingent to Muhammad. In your minds, this is Islam. Whether Muhammad lives or dies, it makes little difference. And then these people were told to re-examine their own selves in the verses of Surah Ali Imran. That Allah is yet to know the true believers amongst you and the people who will engage in his way as opposed to those who are not true believers. So at the defeat of Ohad, I'm just going to quickly finish these two parts. The Muslims retreated. Abu Sufyan, he said, we can go forward. Muhammad has not been killed. Go and finish them off. The Muslims were told that they are coming. The Muslims were wounded. The biggest part played here was by Imam Ali. When the Muslims fled and some of them went to Abu Sufyan and they said, we are ready to rejoin your religion. Give us protection. So this was the state of the Muslims. Even the best of them were scared. In any case, the Muslims went and they reflected upon their state when these verses were being revealed. That indeed we have behaved hypocritically. We went for spoils of war. We do not have grounded faith in our hearts. And the Quran was using this as a means to further embed within their souls the real Islam of the Prophet. The, God says to them, if you die, you're going to come back to me anyway. Isn't that better for you? It was just reshaping their minds. So the wounded Muslims came out to meet with Abu Sufyan. This is another intervention that, ex, that happens throughout the prophetic life after this. The first was in Badr. God says in the Quran, I struck terror in their hearts. At this point as well, God says, I struck terror in their hearts. When they saw you, they were frightened. And then they left and then they went away. The third time, what happens is that when they lay siege on Medina and the trunk, uh, trench is uh, dug, there are thousands of, there, is, there, there are 10,000, 8 to 10,000 of Meccans, different tribes united, of course, and the Jews of uh, Khaybar who are the people who had been expelled from Medina, the Bani Nadir, they too had gathered about 2,000 people. Now there, the Prophet dug a trench, but the people, the Jewish clan in Medina were beginning to attack. This was the truest test for the Muslims. Read Surah Ahzab and see how God describes their state. The Mu'mineen were tested at that point and they shook a tremendous shaking. Some of them they said, and God points out the Munafikin, that our houses are unprotected. They were merely looking for excuses. In any case, there was a violent storm. There, food had been depleted. They had been blocked there by the trench for a month. The Medinan community was suffering from shortage of food and so were the Meccans and there was a violent storm. Of course, the only person that came over was Amr ibn Abdul Wood and Imam Ali put him to death. But when you read these verses, you will see that the Muslims are feeling empowered. Bani Quraidha were then finished off and the Munafikin are getting more and more frustrated. But in the midst of all of this, what is happening is you find 8,000 to 10,000 people coming. They are finding interventions. They are finding that that meet with frustration. The Muslims are outnumbered, all oh, outnumbered all the time. Yet they cannot do anything to the Muslims. This is creating a phenomenal impression in the minds of those around. And they were becoming sympathetic towards Islam, not necessarily due to God's centricity, or its righteousness, but due to that this is the emerging power and we need to be with this power. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to finish what I wanted to do today. I might continue tomorrow. We come to the great martyr of this night. No matter how much mention we make of him, it is not enough. 
He is the backbone of Imam Hussein. And he is the one who inspires our heart. From the very young age, it's the name of Abbas that moves the hearts and brings tears to the eyes. I'm going to narrate very freely today. I really do believe that Imam Hussein genuinely did hope against hope so long as Abbas was alive. There was a commotion and jubilation at a distance. Shimar asks, who has been killed? Abbas ibn Ali has been put to death. He smiled. Now Hussein shall not escape. This is the first time Hussein says, now my back has been broken. Such is Abbas and his stature. In his descriptions we find, Kal Jabal al He was like a lofty mountain. Wa Kalbahu Katawdil Jaseem. And his heart was like a momentous wave. Kana Farisan Hammaman. He was a champion swordsman, a fearless warrior. He would advance amidst the showering arrows and the striking blades and cut the ranks in two. We are told about the great stature of Abbas. That if he were to ascend his steed, his feet may be touching the surface of the ground. Look at how grand this Abbas was. As Bashir comes into Medina, and says, Ya ahla Yathrab ala muqama lakum biha. O people of Yathrab, there is no place for you in Yathrab. Hussein has been killed. And his son who awaits outside the city of Medina. Go and receive him. And pay your condolences to him. An old woman comes and says, O Bashir, this is a lie. It is the truth, O maid of God. How can Hussein be killed? Where was my Abbas? He was killed. But who can face my Abbas? O maid of God, through treachery his arms were severed. And then a maze was struck upon his blessed head, and then he descended upon the earth. He said, O Abbas, had your sword been in your, on you in your hands, none, should have, none would have approached you. We are told, that when Hazrat Abbas's grave needed to be repaired, Sayyid Bahrul Ulum took a builder or a worker to plaster the grave. The worker said, O oh Master, may I ask you a question? He said, Indeed. He said, You always narrate that Abbas's stature was such that if he would ascend a steed, his feet would touch the earth. He said, yes. Then why is his grave so small? Bahrul Ulum struck his head against the grave and cried out, فَقَطَّعُوهُ irban irba." They cut him into pieces. Look at Abbas. His name's Abu Al-Fadl. Kamar Bani Hashim. Hamilu liwa Staqqa. Hami. Fadi. All these beautiful names are his. To get an understanding of this man's bravery in the battle of Sifin, whenever Ali ibn Abi Talib would enter the battlefield, none would approach him. On an occasion, Ali sends his son Abbas, young at that time, with a face covering. He goes into the battlefield, calls for an opponent. Abu Sha'asa comes into the battlefield. Abbas slices him effortlessly. They cry out, it is Ali. Approach him not, he is deceiving you. As there is this commotion in the ranks of the people of Muawiyah, Ali comes into the battlefield behind Abbas. And he places his hand upon the face mask of Abbas. And as he unveils it, he says, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib, wa hada qamar bani Abbas. Ada Kamar Bani Hashim. I am Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the moon of the Hashimis. Such 
is this gallant warrior of ours. Would you want to see his real strength? Think about this. His right arm is cut from his body. And he cries out, Wallah, law qata'atum yameeni, fa inni abadan uhami an deeni. By Allah, even if you cut off my right arm, I shall not cease to defend my deen and my Imam Hussein. When they cut his left arm, he says, O soul, fear not, for they have severed your left arm. Take the glad tidings of the Rahman instead. Imam Zainul Abideen, we say and we hear that he was burying the bodies. And they said there is a body at the banks of the Al-Qama. He refuses to move. Zainul Abideen says, he will not come to me, I shall go to him. We are told that after the massacre, when they were being moved, Zainul Abideen comes to the body of Abbas and he says, Wa Abbas, after you left, the heavens became illuminated and the earth becomes a darkened place for us. If only you heard the cries of your sisters calling out to you as the whip was unleashed upon their backs. Abbas, on the morning of Ashura, is guarding the tents. A companion of Imam Hussein comes to Abbas and he says, Oh Abbas, do you know why your father sought you? He said, he sought you for this day, O oh Abbas, in a state of rage. Abbas says, do you wish to incite me? He goes into the battlefield, engages in a battle, kills many opponents and he comes back and he says, do not incite me. The day progresses. The companions have breathed their last. The brothers of Abbas, the family of Hussein, Ali Akbar, they have all tasted martyrdom. They have all received martyrdom. Abbas comes to Hussein and he says, Oh brother, allow me to fight. I cannot withstand your state of loneliness and destitution. Imam Hussein looks deep in the eyes of Abbas and says, Benafsi anta ya Abbas. May my soul be ransomed for you, O Abbas. If you go, the morale of my army shall be devastated. Abbas said, O Hussein, what army? There is none but you and I. There is a cry from the tents, Abbas, take news. As if a child has died due to thirst. Abbas comes to a place where the water is being kept and he sees little children rubbing the water skins upon their bellies due to thirst. Abbas says, fear not the little children, I shall bring you back water. He picks up a water skin, comes to Hussein, and he says, Hussein, allow me to bring back some water for them. Hussein looks into the eyes of Abbas, knowing he will not see his brother again. Abbas kisses the forehead of Hussein, looks towards the sky and pleads, O oh God, allow me to bring back some water for them. Abbas makes his way. Hussein goes with him. They are intercepted by the enemies. Hussein is wounded. Abbas goes ahead and looks back and says, Oh brother, go back, retreat. Abbas removes the blockade enters into the Alqama, fills the water skin, cups some water and brings it towards his mouth. And he says, O oh soul, you have no right to live after Hussein. Shall you drink of the cold water when Hussein thirsts? He throws away the water and he says, Wallah, ma hada fi aludini. 
By Allah, Abbas's religion does not allow him such a thing. Abbas exits the Alqama, engages in the battle, makes way towards the tent. From behind the trees, someone severs his right arm. Abbas holds his standard and water in the left arm. As he is going, his left arm is severed. From afar, Hussein sees the falling of his standard. Hussein is confused and perplexed. Arrows are released at Abbas. Some enter into his blessed eye, and another enters into the water skin. When Abbas sees that the water has spilled, he stops his steed. A maze strikes the blessed head of Abbas. He lowers his head. He is surrounded by the enemies. Abbas falls to the ground. Hussein ascends Zuljana. Take me to my brother, O Zuljana. Zuljana stops at a, pl at a place. Have you found my brother? He descends from the horse. He says, Zuljana, where is my Abbas? And he sees the severed arm of Abbas. He moves on and sees the lion of Hussein about to breathe his last. He takes the head of Abbas into his lap. Abbas moves away his head. Abbas is saying something. Hussein draws near to him and he's saying, Oh man, wait for a while. Allow my brother to come to me first. It is I, Hussein, O oh Abbas. There is a wound in one eye, and another eye has been shot with an arrow. Imam Hussein takes Abbas's head into his lap, cleanses his face of dust. Abbas's eyes flood with tears. Hussein says, O oh, Abbas, what brings grief to your heart? He says, O oh, brother, how may I not grieve? When I see you lifting my head from the dust and cleansing it from dust, while I know that very soon you will be beheaded on a burning thirst and none shall come and lift your head. Hussein cries out aloud. Hussein tries to pick the body of Abbas. Hussein, what is it that you do? Abbas, allow me to take you back. He says, Hussein, allow me to stay here. I feel embarrassment from your daughter Sakina. If Zainab sees me in this state, her morale will break. Hussein advances without Abbas, carrying the standard of Abbas. From afar, the children see the standard of Abbas. They run and behind them is Zainab. Sakina calls out, O oh, father, what news do you bring of my uncle Abbas? He is slain at the banks of al Kama, O oh, child. Zainab says, O oh brother, why did you not bring my brother back to me? He said, O oh Zainab, he was mindful of you even on his last breath. Matam Hussein. Is there a stand? Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. Chadar is Sambal Zainab. Abbas Jar. Chadar is Sambal Zainab. 
अब्बास जा रहे हैं चादर संभाल जना अब्बास जा रहे हैं है चादर यू हैव टू गिव मी साथ अदरवाइज आई वॉन्ट बी रिसाइटिंग ऑन माई ओन चादर संभाल जना अब्बास जा रहे हैं चादर संभाल जना अब सद सद का निकाल जना सद का निकाल जना अब्बास जा रहे चादर संभाल चादर संभाल रहे चादर छीनेगी जिस दम सब कौन पास होगा कैदी बनेंगे जब हम सब कौन पास होगा मत कर सवाल जैनाब अब्बास जा रहे हैं संभाल जैन चादर संभाल मकतल में खोल जाए गाजी के बाद बचे बेहाल हो न जाए गाजी के बाद बचे रखना खयाल जैनाब रखना खयाल जैनाब अब्बास जा रहे हैं चादर संभाल जैन अब्बास जा रहे हैं परदेश में छीनेगी अब तेरे सर से चादर अब बाल खोल अपने ए बीबी अपने सर पर हाय खाक डाल जैनाब हाय खाक डाल जैनाब अब्बास जा रहे हैं चादर सम अब्बास जा रहे हैं चादर संभाल जैनाब बच्चों के अब तमाचे ए बीबीओ लगेंगे शाम गरीब होगी खै में भी आस जलेंगे वक्त सवाल जैनाब वक्त सवाल जैनाब अब्बास जा रहे हैं चादर संभाल जैन संभाल जैन शहर गए तन कोई नहीं है के बाद शेखा कोई नहीं है जैन शेखा खयाल जैनाब 
شہ کا خیال زینب عباس جا رہے ہیں غادر سنبھال زینب غازی کے گرد پھر کر آنچل کی تو ہوا دے شان پہ ہاتھ رکھ کر عباس کو دعا دے اے پر ملال زینب اے پر ملال زینب عباس جا رہے ہیں شاد سنبھال زین عباس جا رہے شاد سنبھال زین رہے ہیں سد کا نکال زین صدقہ نکال زینب عباس جا رہے ہیں چادر سنبھال زینب عباس جا رہے چادر سنبھال زینب عباس جا رہے We'll be having a Q&A straight after Maghrib, uh, but if we can all prepare for Salah right now. Thank you. Salawat. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Subhanallah wa alhamdulillah wa la ilaha illallah wa allahu akbar wa lillah ilhamd. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أشهد أن محمد رسول الله اللهم صل على وآل محمد أشهد أن علي ولي الله أشهد أن عليا حجة الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة
Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Would I kindly ask you to be seated The Q&A is just going to begin If you are able to move forward as far as possible, if you can, space yourself out a little bit. There's lots of space in the back. Thank you so much. Can we recite a loud salawat and then ask Sheikh Arif to begin? Sant. Okay, we'll get straight into it. Does anyone have any questions for Sheikh Arif? Let's not be shy. So based on the lecture topic of prophethood and transformation, if anyone has any questions based on the past few nights, now's the time to ask. Actually, Sheikh, I have a question. Um, you said yesterday that the Quran um, delivers its message through essence. Or, or in essence, and you talked about how wudu wasn't really, it's not really relevant in the direction in which you do wudu. It's more about the wiping so that you prepare for salah. How do you combat that with the hadith that we have about the prophets, about the prophet and the imams talking about the direction of the wudu and the fact that they shared that there was a certain direction? <clears throat> so the way I understand these conflicting texts is, through the method of form and essence. So the Quran, when it comes, it's minimalistic and it's more essence-based, whereas the Hadith is highly contextualized. Now, in addition to that, the Ahadith conflict with each other. So how do you resolve that? I mean, the traditional method is to find the most authentic chain. And then you take that one and you resolve the conflict through the process of reconciliation, either rejecting a hadith or saying, okay, this one is saying you can do this and this one is saying you must do this, so it's wajib or it's, it's mustahab, for example. So my own method is that, well, no, it's actually talking about essence. So wudu means purity. The Quran has said, wash your arms, wash your face, wash your arms, wipe your head, wipe your feet. You know, if you look at the previous prophets, like Isa, alayhi, he used to wash his hands and face. And that's why you find, I think, in front of the church is a tap when you go to Rome and other places. So people can purify themselves and then go to uh, the mosque to pray. So what is not important is the direction. What the Imams were giving us were the best practice. It does not mean it's the only practice. So the fact that the Sahabi had to ask the Imam the method of wudu a hundred and uh, hundred odd years after the Prophet, that to me says that that particular fixation on the direction of wudu and the form of wudu wasn't a question for those earlier Sahaba. It becomes a thing afterwards. Now when you study the Muslims, especially the Ja'afari fiqh, we will see that there was no notion of najasa as we have now coded in fic books. It did not exist. It has actually come about after 
the era of the imams and then in uh, retroactively it's been pinned on the verses and so on and so forth but prior previous to that you can't interpret najasa in the meaning that we interpret it uh, afterwards so najasa at a later date came to mean any substance on your body whose presence does not allow you to engage in prayer so what we can deduce from the earlier uh, hadith is that najis substance are detrimental but you don't find this strict understanding that najasa on your body is an impediment from prayer for example so let me just explain form and essence a bit more here the alcohol is a prohibition in islam you know, we we know that intoxication is prohibition in islam but in terms of the impurity of intoxicants you will find a hadith on two sides one say it's impure wash your garments the other one which are far more explicit will say it is haram to consume but it's not an impure substance so you can pray with alcohol spilt on your garments now here the ulama will say that the hadith that say that alcohol is not an impure substance are explicit they are very clear they're saying it's not najis and they are solid and the uh, hadith they say that the alcohol is an impure substance they are apparent not explicit yes it's 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 a way in which we analyze words it's an explicit word it doesn't have any other meaning it's an apparent word it has several meanings the most obvious meaning is this so it's an apparent meaning when you contrast these two uh, hadith together you will see that the explicit ones should take precedence over the apparent one. Now, that would be very easy. We would say, well, that's fine. Then why do the ulama say that it is a najis substance when you have so many explicit ahadith? They say, because the last ahadith, the seventh imam was asked, well, we have two sets of ahadith from Imam Baqir and Imam Sadiq, and which one should we prefer? Is it najis or is it not najis? So the seventh imam said, well, then take it as najis. Now, my counter argument here is that all the people to whom Imam Bakir said it is not najis are treating it as unnajis. To all the people that Imam Sadiq said that alcohol is not najis but it is haram to consume are going about their daily lives thinking that this substance is not an impure substance. It's, it's, it's a haram to consume but it's not an impure substance. Now, those people are on this side and the other people to whom it is said that it is najis are treating it as najis. Now you can't in our theology accept that the imams are lying or that the imams don't know the law. You can't accept that. So just because the reconciliation cannot be found in imam, the seventh imam says prefer the najis ones over the tahara one, the way I understand it is that no, these were contextual adaptations that in essence the Quran does not talk about the najasa of the alcohol it just talks about its prohibition so it's prohibited the Quran is not concerned about Tahir and Najis the Imams were looking at their followers and in order to distance them from alcohol obviously they gave those instructions that wash your garments and pray again in order to remove them from any proximity to intoxicants so this is the reconciliation that is offered within form and essence. If you look at the Quran to resolve the conflict, the Quran is silent. So that means the Quran does not consider it as najis, according to me. But even if somebody were to say, well, the Quran did not come to give lock, stock and barrel of the law, I will say, well, it wasn't important enough for the Quran to give in the first place. It wasn't important enough. So according to the Quran's neutral position is most akin to the sense of its purity. But if you can't derive it from the Quran, then by contrasting the ahadith, you will say either one of the imams has led the people astray and the other imam has led the people aright. That is something that is untenable. You can't conclude that way. The imams don't do this. So the only other reconciliation is that it is for, based on form and essence. In essence, it's got nothing to do with purity and purity. The form is made impure in order to drive people away from it. Similarly, wudu. Wudu, the essence is to wash certain limbs in order to prepare the soul for the reception of God. 
And if there is no wudu, then do the dry ablution, as the Quran says, in Lam Tajiduman, Fatayammu Sa'ida, then do tayammu and wipe your faces and wipe your hands. Now, the whole essence there is to prepare the soul to substances that are impactful for the physical being and for the soul that bring us in a state of preparedness for receiving God. So, so that's my method of form and essence. So of course, I've explained it in, in great detail in some of the articles. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? I have a few questions online, but I will take priority from anyone who wants to ask in person. Thank you, Sheikh. It's just a minor thing. I think you would further explain for the benefit of all of us. That when a question is asked from a masoom, and masoom answers among all Muslims, the Shias especially, it is considered that that becomes an obligatory act. And if a question is asked, an imam or masoom says no, that means it's forbidden. And if imam or masoom has acted upon certain practice, that is also obligatory or recommended. But if a masoom is silent, then it is the discretion of the people to think as what they would like to do in particular circumstances. What I do not find anywhere in the jurisprudence is, as you have just said in the previous answering previous question is, where Quran is silent, why they are making rules? If Quran is silent on certain issues, then why Muslims have to struggle and try to find a rule which is not in the Quran. The Quran is silent. It gives way to people. It gives a lot of room to the people to do what they want to do. But jurisprudence doesn't accept that. Could you please explain why is that? This is a, obviously it's a very brilliant observation. But I'm just going to add it to that. Give, give, give gives more credibility and weight to what you have said. So Imam Sadiq Salamullah was asked about the marine creatures, which of them are halal and which of them are haram, right? So Imam Sadiq's simple response was recitation of the verse of the Quran. He said, and take from the sea or the ocean uh, your sustenance and eat it. He said, look, according to the Quran, everything is halal. <laughs> Can you see that? That's what Imam Sadiq said. According to the Quran, everything is halal. Now, Imam Sadiq was again, actually I believe when I analyzed all those, uh, all those texts, was acting in accordance with form and essence. So he said, but, but Imam Ali used to prohibit four types of fish and then he narrated them. Because Imam Ali, what he was doing was, and I just want to explain this, take a minute and explain this. In essence, all marine creatures are halal. They're all halal, they're not haram. But why did Imam Ali prohibit four types of fish? Now, I think we need to read them in that context, but at, because at that point, maybe there was something there in those fish, or there was something there in the people that were around Imam Ali that they could not tolerate that meat at that point. And therefore, he singled out four types of fish. He said, don't eat them. He would go into the marketplace and he would tell them, don't sell this, yes? like seal and other few um, uh, species of fish. But Imam Sadiq's time, he said, no, the Quranic verse is saying it's all halal, eat. Then Imam Sadiq later on said, well, Imam Ali used to prohibit these four. Now, maybe he was facing pressure there. Now, when you study the Imams, you will see that they were under a lot of pressure from their followers. I want to explain this just a little bit more. Now, Imam Sadiq, uh, sorry, Imam Ali said, don't eat fish without scale. Now, Imam Sadiq says, it's fine, eat the fish from the sea. So why would Imam Ali say, don't eat fish with scales on it? Yes, you can say simply because those people did not understand which type of fish Imam Ali was trying to tell them was detrimental for them. So he just gave them a, a, a very simple rule. Scaleless fish, don't eat them. So at least you're assured to not eat those four ones that are detrimental for you at this stage. At the time of Imam Sadiq, obviously he would know more what his grandfather has said. And you don't find a man with the brilliance of Imam Sadiq anyway in this world. 
Then later on, he said, but Imam Ali did say also that don't eat scaleless fish. So you can see the default position that Imam Sadiq acquires is fish is halal according to the Quran. Eat it. Then he moves from his position, and I think that was probably because of duress and pressure that he was getting from the context. Now, similarly, you find the Imams behaving in accordance with what the people actually expect them to do. It's, it's unfortunate that they were under so much pressure. So, for example, the time of Namaz of Maghrib, the Imams were adamant. We read our fiqh books that read when the sun has set. There's no need to wait. There is no need to wait. Now, I think from what I remember, I taught this a very long time ago, they asked Imam, the eighth Imam, well, why do you pray at the, at the setting of the sun and not wait? Imam said, well, I told you guys to pray a bit late. You were not doing it, so I started praying early. Now, and Imam doesn't give a response like that, right? That's just to just keep them uh, silent and quiet. But you see this, this form and essence business everywhere when you study the hadith of the uh, Imams in Halal and Haram. I accept your position on this, that when the Quran is silent, then that's it, that's the law. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Does anyone have a... Yep. Salam, Sheikh. So. Uh, I'm going to move away from fiki questions now. Uh, I just wanted a bit of a clarification about what you mentioned about um, the Muslims and the Prophet raiding caravans. Um, I do understand that the context was different, obviously, and what was the practice of the time, and that the Mushrik of Mecca had wronged the Muslims, uh, but still struggling to um, get around the idea of Muslims stealing from somebody else and even going to the extent of harming them and, you know, you mentioned even killing them. Uh, so if you could maybe expand on that a bit more for me, please. Thank you. So uh, let, let, let me just give a, a little bit of a prelude context to that. The Prophet was in a context and he was abiding by that context. So long as he did not see it unjust and immoral and below his nobility. So, you see slavery in the time of the Prophet, it was prevalent. You see right and possession, the women that man used to possess after warfare. That was the context. So the Prophet was abiding by that context. It was not seen as immoral by the standards of the day. Now, I argue this in the fourth book that morality changes as human nobility becomes more and more refined. A simple sort of a an example to make this clearer would be that 10 years ago, we did not find it morally reprehensible that women got less pay for the same work that they would do that a man would do and man would get more pay. 15 years on, now our sense of nobility has become refined a great deal more. So we ask a question, isn't this unjust? And therefore, we redress that issue. And we say, well, no, women should get equal pay for the same job that they do that a man does. And if they do it as well as a man does, for example. But it wasn't seen as a reprehensible thing 15 years ago. This is in our own lifetime. Many years ago, 100 odd years ago, children were hit. When I was at school, we used to get caned, for example. And that was fine. You get caned for behaving badly or certain things that you might do. Today, teachers are not allowed to hit children. 40 years ago, it was fine. Now, it's not fine. The human nobility is becoming refined and the sense of justice is changing how to give everything its rightful due existentially. So in the context of the prophet, slavery was fine. Right hand position was fine. Raiding caravans was fine. It was an absolute norm and acceptable. But the Prophet was also initiating a process of refining people's morals and putting them on an evolutionary track and trajectory so that they grow and become more and more refined. So the Quran began to free slaves. 
with the hope that this trend will reach a point where human beings will stop slavery altogether. However, in the case of the raids, there was another justification that the Quran gives, that they expelled you from your dwellings. They confiscated your wealth. What else are you supposed to do but to adhere to this common practice? Of course, some historians say it was a common practice and that's why people did not frown upon it. It's a common practice, then you can then resort to this practice to retrieve what is your right. Now, that was the immediate justification for the raids. Now, you have to bear in mind that mistakes were made. This was not the prophet who killed the people. The prophet did not kill that one person who was killed in that raid. It was one of the Sahabi. Now, that was something that the prophet himself was seeing it as a mistake that you should not have killed in the Shahrul Haram. But the Quran intervenes and it says, look, fighting is bad in Shahrul Haram. But as opposed to that, taking people out of their homes, barring them from Masjidul Haram is far worse than what happened there. That justification was given. The difficulty is that we in our mind are looking at the Prophet as an absolute moral agent by today's standard back in the 6th, 7th century Arabia. He is at the peak of morals in his own context and he is bringing the bodies and human beings to the peak of their own morals by initiating processes. That is the bit of a problem that we are encountering right now in our thinking. If we were to look at the story of the Prophet as a real human endeavor in which he was facing all the frailties that humanity is facing, all the weaknesses, and through that navigating very carefully, then we will understand him a bit better. Now, I'll give you a living thing right now, an example that we are living through right now, a situation. It has become difficult to consume meat, not because the animals only because that the animals should have rights, but more so for somebody like me, is that our human nobility ought not to allow us to eat flesh of another living being. Now, I know that argument can be stretched and say, well, plants are living beings as well, and why do you eat them, and so on and so forth. But I'm just saying human nobility in itself is subject to emotions and how you see things. If in the future we understand that the animal is more than happy to be cut and its flesh to be consumed, then it's perfectly fine, I suppose. Human nobility will allow this. But today, for us to consume meat is not frowned upon. However, in a hundred years from now, it might become very difficult for us to eat meat. Now, if somebody a hundred years from now looks back at this time and says, how can those people be so barbaric and consume living beings and not have the heart to stop butchering these animals and consuming them. I mean, think of it from a very angelic perspective. It's a very barbaric, uh, animalistic act of eating meat. Of course, we will be able to clone meat and all whatnot. I'm not saying that the final judgment will be that we stop eating meat, but I'm just saying today, in order for me to be true to my own humanity, the frailty of my humanity and the state of nobility definitely is posing a problem that it's not because of the animal rights debate, but it is because of the state of nobility of human beings that it's such a barbaric act. By the way, I do eat meat and I do like it, but I'm just saying there's still a struggle inside there. So if we can understand things in their proper perspective and context. Yeah? Amazing. Thank you, Sheikh, for that. I think Hasnain has a question. Uh, unfortunately, we're kind of... It's up to be very quick. Um, sure. So just on that, on the caravan raids, I still struggle to accept your answer your, about contextualization, partly because the two things we're talking about are theft and murder, which are both very universally immoral and very with context historically that go far beyond a thousand, two thousand years. Um, 
But wouldn't it be easier to reconcile this if we considered it a, polit a political act? So there are multiple theories of social change that talk about how disruption of capital movement is really key to creating social reform or political reform. So wouldn't it be much easier explained in that way rather than trying to... Because it also then questions the universality of... So is it now sunnah to raid caravans? Like that's the kind of question that would come up, right? So first and foremost, I think the concepts, the, the, the terms that you use, theft and murder, yes? Because theft and murder have connotations. They are packed terms. <laughs> they have a baggage, right? Murder is something that's frowned upon. And theft is something that's frowned upon. If the Prophet understood that as theft, then he would not have ordained it. Can you see that? Because it... Whatever the Prophet ordained, he did not see this, see it as morally apprehensible. Yeah? Although he did not like the fact that a man was killed in the sacred month, but he may not have had a problem with the person being killed because he did not see that as murder. Now that, the justification for that was that, well, they are at war with us. Now, whether somebody analyzes it and says it was right or wrong for the Prophet to understand it in that way, the story on the prophetic side is that it is perfectly fine because they have expelled us from our homes, they have persecuted us, and they have killed us. Because the Meccans, the Meccan Muslims were killed. Sumayya was speared and won her belief. So it's a state of war, and we are allowed to do that. The other thing I want to point out here is that, of course, I didn't get the time to talk about it. Not all, I mean, the Muslims are naive in saying that the Prophet just defended himself in battles. No, there were preemptive strikes. We have to acknowledge by looking at the Quran, looking at the history, that there were preemptive strikes as well. Now the morality of a preemptive strike, is it moral or not? We'll have to then discuss that fully. But by looking at the context of the Prophet, we will not be able to deduce, because it's. I think it will be one of the most dangerous deductions ever, to say that the Prophet was justifying the means through the ends that he had in mind. Because then that would totally be immoral. That would be an immoral act. So I'm saying that the Prophet was taking the decision on the spot as the situations were being faced. And he did not see that as an unjust means towards a just end. Because that, that would then be going against the whole makeup of the blessed Prophet, a moral human being. If somebody can say that, then, then we would have a big problem. That he wanted to change the status quo and it was a political game that he was playing. And then, because we normally associate Muawiyah with such sort of uh, uh, political uh, sort of uh, strategy. Yeah, okay. I mean, dinner will be served, so maybe you guys can carry on, carry this on in the dining table. Yeah, sure, sure. So, as mentioned, uh, thank you for the Q for the Q and A, Sheikh. Uh, dinner will be served in the dining room. You can feel free to either eat in the dining room or by the fountain. I just want to reiterate that doesn't mean the back garden or the front garden, but by the fountain. Um, just before we do head over to the Q and A, I just want to announce tomorrow's program. It will start at seven fifty again with Quran lecture, Matam, ziyarat, and then end with namaz and dinner. And just before we make our way to the dining room, can I invite Sheikh Mahmoud to just give us a few words, please? Can we invite him with a salawat? Ahsant. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just a few minutes. I know you. Uh, we've had a, a a long program today. Today I don't want to speak about the Yemen appeal in that sense. You have information about it already. I just wanted to highlight a little bit from our textual sources about sadaqa. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Aminu billahi wa rasulih. Wanfiqu mimma ja'alakum mustakhlafina fi. Believe in Allah and his messenger and spend of that whereof he has made you trustees. If you look closer at this verse, 
faith in Allah and belief in Allah and his messenger and we've talked about the prophet and the transformation which has been the topic of this lecture series you can see that spending is being talked about in the same verse and it's also talking about us being made trustees of this you can think about this deeper in your own time فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَنْفَقُوا لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ And such of you as believe and spend, theirs will be a great reward. In another place, people approach the Prophet to ask, what should we spend? يَسْأَلُونَكَ مَاذَا يُنْفِقُونَ People ask, what should we spend? Tell them, whatever you spend, spend for your parents. وَلِلْوَالِدَيْنِ وَالْأَقْرَبِينَ وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ For your parents, your relatives, orphans, the needy and the wayfarer. وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ And whatever good you do, Allah has knowledge of it. Nothing goes unnoticed. We find in the Risalatul Hukuk of Imam Zainul Abideen, which is the treatise of rights where he describes things and people and their rights it is amazing have a look at it if you get a chance and he describes the right of charity and he says the right of charity is that you know it is a storing away with your lord and a deposit for which you will have no need for witnesses subhanallah see it as an investment and in the most secure and best of places if you deposit it in secret you will be more confident of it than if you deposit it in public at Imam Zainul Abidin's death provisions which used to be delivered at the doorsteps of many people in Medina by a man with a covered face suddenly stopped appearing and people realized that it was him indeed and of course he was following in the footsteps of his fathers and he ends you should know that it repels afflictions and illnesses from you in this world and it will repel the fire from you in the next world finally I want to end by a hadith of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam salawatullahi alayhi Muhammad wa ali Muhammad where we actually see a correlation between charity not only in the hereafter but here and now and he says cure your sick by giving sadaqah or charity and remove troubles and mishaps by giving charity and increase sustenance with the charity if you wish to support the Yemen appeal you can do so at the front desk. Finally, can I kindly ask you to recite Surah Fatiha for all the Marid and the Marhumin for whom tonight has been dedicated and whose names are on the screens. Al-Fatiha. <laughs>